Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I want to thank everybody for following us on YouTube. The Bible studies have a great response from people all over the place, outside of our church as well. So we're very thankful for you, and we we welcome you here to this Bible study, which is going to be on Acts chapter 24. So to begin, I'm going to ask Jeffrey Morris to open up in prayer. Brother Jeffrey, would you open in prayer, please? Yes. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you again for the privilege of coming before you, Lord, as a group just to just uh, study your word, Lord, and to meditate on your word, Lord. Lord, help that the uh, words that we, that, that the teaching that we have, Lord, it will take root in our hearts, Lord, and be found to be in good ground, Lord, and be profitable to us, Lord, that we may be able to meditate night on day, Lord, become stronger and better Christians, Lord, and the work is for you, Lord, by what we learn tonight, Lord. So just ask that your um, guidance, Lord, will be upon our teacher today, Pastor Lapos. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jeffrey. We are on Acts chapter 24. Let's just review where Paul is so you'll understand the context of this chapter. If you remember, Paul was moved in his heart to go to Jerusalem because the Lord would show him in Jerusalem after being persecuted that he was to go to Rome. In fact, the visit to Jerusalem was a stepping stone to bring Paul to Rome because there the Jews persecuted him heavily and the Romans took him in custody to protect him and actually uh, started the process to send him to Rome. So we pick up the story where Paul is transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea, where there is a governor of Rome called Felix, and uh, he was put uh, in prison by Felix. He was also heard, and the charges were brought against him by the Jews, who followed him after five days. Ananias, the high priest, and some of the elders followed Paul to, uh, to Caesarea to accuse Paul to uh, Felix, the governor. And they used an orator by the name of Tertullus. You can see here his name. That was common in those days to use orators to make a chase because orators uh, were actually professional speakers, professional debaters. And they were used oftentimes in court cases and to bring accusation and to use flowery language to, uh, to be able to persuade the authorities to condemn the accused. So that's where we're at. So we're going to start with verses one, actually verse one, which is which says, now after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus, and they gave evidence to the governor against Paul. They gave evidence to the government, to the governor against Paul. This is common and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have to expect evidence to be granted and to be offered against us as well, because Christians are going to be challenged all over the world to defend our faith. And they're going to be presenting evidences or so-called evidences of the falsehood of the Christian life. And sometimes you'll get these evidences or these contradictions or challenges at work, sometimes at school, sometimes with family, sometimes with friends. But at some point in your life, you're going to have to defend the Christian faith against certain what they call evidences. So I thought I'd list some of the common ones. I'm going to take a look at them now. Here are some of the common evidences against the Christian faith. Of course, there's the theory of evolution. Evolution is in direct contradiction to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, in which it states that God created the world in six days, six 24-hour days, and that the earth is young, only about maybe six or 7,000 years old, maybe 10 at the most, 10,000 at the most. Because we don't know how much time Adam and Eve spent in the Garden of Eden before they sinned, that, that there's no indication of that whatsoever. Another uh, evidence against the Christian faith is the Big Bang, which was supposed to happen billions of years ago, where everything was concentrated, uh, the entire universe was concentrated into something the size of a pea. Can you believe that? And the pea exploded and produced a universe which is made up of light years of galaxies and constellations and planets and stuff. Uh, it's incredible how people believe that. But anyway, that's one of the evidences that they bring against us. Another one is starlight. And they ask the question, how is it that stars are light years away and yet we can see them? And uh, because a lot of time passes between the time the light leaves the star and gets to the earth. So the question is, how did Adam and Eve see the stars? God created the stars 
and they all had light. How was it that Adam and Eve saw stars almost immediately? So they bring that up. Another evidence that they're going to bring against the Christian faith is that Genesis was written centuries after Moses, that it was written by Jewish scribes much later than Genesis actually occurred. Although it said, although Jesus and others maintain that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, the first five books of the Bible, they also they will bring up the fact that, or the fact, or the or the accusation that Israel never spent any time in Egypt, and that the whole story of of Israel being slaves in Egypt was a complete myth, <clears throat> as well as the flood. Noah's flood is a myth, even though it's found in many cultures. They'll also bring up the point that Jesus never lived, that there was no such person as Jesus of Nazareth, and that he was an invention of the apostles. That he was, And those who believe Jesus did live will maintain that he was never crucified, and if he was crucified, never resurrected. They'll bring up the subject of the Crusades as well, and they're going to refute the Christian faith on the basis that the Crusades were not Christian activities at all and that Christians are responsible for the death of many thousands of people through the Crusades. They'll also say that the faith is a denial of the mind, that it's anti-science, anti-intellectual, and that it's wish wishful thinking. Or they'll bring up the subject that Christians are all hypocrites, that we don't live out our faith, and that we're nothing like Jesus. One of the most popular ones that they bring up is, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the, wor in the world? And one of the other ones they bring up is that the Bible is no different than any other religious book. So let's just go through these very quickly again. Evolution, the Big Bang, Starlight, Genesis written centuries after Moses, Israel never in Egypt, Flood is a myth found in many cultures, Jesus never lived, he was never crucified or resurrected, the Crusades are a problem, faith is a denial of the mind, it's anti-science and wishful thinking, all Christians are hypocrites, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? The Bible is no different than any other religious books, uh, any other religious book. Now all of these can be refuted every one of them. And if you do your research and you train yourself, you should be able to give good answers and good responses to every one of these challenges, because there is an explanation and good reason to believe that these challenges are absolutely false. But you have to be able to defend yourself and you have to be able to do the research and find out exactly what to say and what the research shows, because these things are not valid. None of these are valid at all. We'll move on to the next part of the of Acts 24, we'll look at some of the tactics that were used against Paul, and you should expect these tactics to be used against you as well, should you ever be brought up to be accused before government or before the courts. Uh, just take a look at what Tertullus did to try to convince Felix to condemn Paul. And when he was called upon, <clears throat> Tertullus began his accusation saying, now note carefully his accusation, seeing that through you, we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further. I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. So Tertullus starts off with flattery. He flatters Felix. He flatters the authority and tries to butter him up so that he can get Felix to condemn Paul. Verse 5. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension amongst all the Jews throughout the world, which was an interesting charge because, you see, Judaism was recognized by the Roman government as an official religion, but Christianity wasn't. The Christian faith was pretty new, actually, and uh, it was never recognized until Constantine became emperor 10 emperors later. It, the persecution of Christians started with Nero and continued for 10 emperors after and ended with Diocletian. And when Constantine became an emperor, only then was the Christian faith recognized as the only official religion in Rome. But at that time, Judaism was an official religion. Anyone who would cause dissension amongst the Jews, that would come to the attention of the Romans, and they would have to do something about it as protectors of official religions. But look at what he says. He calls, he calls Paul a man of the plague. And that's very interesting language because it's very derogatory and inflammatory language. And Paul was hardly a plague, but that's what he calls him to try to, again, convince Felix to condemn Paul. He also calls him in the rest of the verse, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. It's interesting that he uses the word ringleader because ringleader gives a false implication 
And it's a misleading word because it gives the impression that Paul was the leader of a terrorist group. So uh, a ringleader is uh, uh, the leader of a group that is not kosher at all. Look at this one now. In verse 6, he says he tried to profane the temple. That was a fragrant lie because they accused Paul of bringing a Gentile into the temple court. Well, he never did bring a Gentile into the temple court. In fact, he left the Gentile outside while he went in. He was seen walking with Gentiles in Jerusalem, but never once did he bring a Gentile into the temple court. So Tertullus presents a flagrant lie to Felix. Then he talks and he continues by saying that we seized him and we wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias, who was a Roman, Roman governor, a Roman uh, a supervisor or, or a centurion, came by with his great and great with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. It's interesting that he talks about this great violence because the violence was actually started by the Jews. If you remember, Lysias had to call in the army to save Paul from being beaten to death because it was the Jews that fell upon Paul and started beating him for his testimony about Jesus Christ. And Lysias had to bring the army in to bring order into the situation. But by saying that Lysias came with great violence, he accuses Lysias, the Roman supervisor of violence, that was supposed to be unwarranted, which was an absolute, another absolute lie. So what he does, he accuses the authorities of wrongdoing and hopes to gain sympathy from Felix by condemning the Roman supervisor or the centurion. Very tricky stuff. Then he says, by examining him yourself, listen to what he says to Felix here, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So now he's using manipulation because he is basically twisting Felix's arm to accuse Paul by saying that if you just listen to the facts, if you listen to what we're telling you, there'll be no choice but for you to accuse him, which is absolute manipulation. If this was in a court of law today, it would be thrown out as leading the witness. Here's an artist depiction of Paul standing before Felix. As you can see, Felix is 100% Roman. And here is Paul defending himself before Felix. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, and I do more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Now note verses 12 and 13. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. Now this leads me to believe, or to assert, that it's right to defend ourselves when we are falsely accused, and we will be falsely accused, no question about it, especially if we're brought up before courts or before the government. And it may not secure our vindication. It, it may not produce anything. We may still be condemned, condemned anyway, but at least it will demonstrate that we refuse to entertain lies. Now, we don't mind being persecuted for our faith. Uh, we don't mind if the courts say it's illegal for you to preach the gospel and, and we decide to preach anyway and be thrown into prison. But we will not, and we should not, entertain lies about us. We need to defend ourselves against lies. And we must be dressed in the armor of God to be able to deal with unwarranted attacks against us. So here's the armor of God. Let's take a look at it. We have the helmet of salvation here. We have the breastplate of righteousness here. The shield of faith. The belt of truth. The shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the sword of the spirit. And each one of these pieces of the armor of God can be used when we are falsely accused and when we're brought before the authorities to defend our faith. And here's how I listed it. The helmet of salvation will help us against doubt and unbelief because when the accusations come that our faith is a bunch of myths, because we know we're saved and because we know the truth of the gospel, we'll be able to defend ourselves and we will not allow these uh, unbelieving thoughts to come into our minds and get us to stumble about our faith. The breastplate of righteousness will help us when there's character assassination against us. They'll accuse us of being bigots, of being liars, of being hypocrites. But we know that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So having the breastplate of light righteousness prepared and understanding that we have been made holy by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be able to deal with any charge of character assassination against us. The belt of truth will help us to defend against lies. 
the shoes of the gospel of, of the preparation of the gospel of peace is our foundation. Everything we are, everything we know, everything that we've experienced comes from the gospel. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again after three days. And when we believed in him, he sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. That is the foundation of everything that we believe, everything that we stand for. And the gospel has to be very strong and secured in our hearts to be able to resist doubt and unbelief, character assassination and lies, because the gospel is the truth upon which we stand. The shield of faith will protect us against persecution. Persecution, I can relate that to the fiery arrows that the devil shoots against us. Persecution can come in many forms. Persecution can come through imprisonment, through harassment, through laws written against us. It can come through troubles, the troubles of everyday life, the loss of somebody we love, the loss of pets like Valerie went through just recently. All kinds of things can happen through persecution. But the shield of faith, confidence in God, helps us to ward off any arrows, any fiery arrows of the enemy. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is our weapon of attack. And we should not be afraid to use the Bible against any accusation and against any charge or any false evidence given against us, because the Word of God is mighty and active like a two-edged sword and pierces to the division of bones and marrow and of soul and spirit. And I don't think that Christians use the word of God enough. I really don't. Because in my experience, when I've shared my faith with unbelievers, uh, I can talk and I can argue and I can make the case pretty well. But when I pull out the Bible and I show them a scripture verse to back up what I'm saying and actually have them read it, you wouldn't believe how much power that has. And then finally, prayer is also a weapon of warfare. It's a weapon of attack and empowerment because prayer can attack spiritual forces that are unseen, that are working against us. And also, it empowers us personally to be able to stand up to whatever happens to us. Now we continue with Paul's defense in verses 14 to 16. And I want you to look at this very carefully because this is an extremely important defense that he makes. And I want you to take note of the underlying portions of the scripture. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. That is an extremely important section of Scripture. And I'm going to ask the question, what was Paul hoping to show in this part of, first part of his defense that is crucial to our faith? This section is very crucial to our faith. So look at the underlying portions and tell me why this passage and why this defense is so important to us. And let's start with Caroline. I'll put it back up so you can see it. Just, in, just a second. Okay, Caroline. Thank you. Why is this important? Take a look at the underlying portions. So why uh, remember why the Jews accused Paul, Paul hoping to show yeah what was he hoping to show remember the Jews accused him of being a, a a contrary to the law that he was against the temple that he was against Judaism that he was worshiping a false god so that's why this section is so important with that I think I've helped you to be able to figure out why this defense is so important well um the, even the first line on verse 14 that he says he's worshiping the God of my fathers. It's not a, a false God. It's the same God as the one that he was brought up in, which was the same uh, as them, the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees. Well, he was a Pharisee. Right. So they already, for them to already make an accusation against him saying that it's a false God, they're, they're pointing the finger back at themselves then because he started off with the God of his fathers, which is the same God it's just that he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, so Justin, what about this next part here? Why is that important for our faith? The part that I've highlighted. Because it refers to the uh, Old Testament. It refers to the Old Testament. Why, why was that important in that context? Because, because it brings out uh, Jesus through the scriptures. It brings out Jesus through the scriptures because the Jews had accused Paul of being an enemy of the old covenant, an enemy of the law. 
And here he says that he upholds the things that were written in the law and the prophets, which speak about Jesus. And Oliver, what about this section? Why is this important? Referring to the resurrection of the dead. Because that indi indicates where we, as Christians, we have uh, a different in foundation that we believe in the resurrection. Yeah. But they, the Jews also believed in the resurrection of the dead. In particular, the Pharisees did. So what Paul was showing was that he was not against Judaism at all. In fact, he establishes that faith in Jesus, somebody just came in, faith in Jesus is an extension of the old covenant. And it's very important when we talk to Jewish people, if we ever get the chance to witness to a Jew, that we are not contrary to the Jewish faith. We worship the same God. We follow the same law. We adhere to the prophecies given in that law and in the prophets. So we have a tremendous amount of respect and reliance on the old covenant. And we believe in the resurrection of the dead, which has two aspects to it. One, the righteous will be resurrected into the eternal kingdom of God. And the unrighteous will be resurrected to be judged by God and be condemned in hell forever. So we establish that faith in Jesus is an extension of the old covenant. We also establish that Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is the fulfillment of the law because the old covenant speaks of Jesus throughout. In fact, to Abraham, God said that it would be his seed that would bless the nations. Who is that seed? That seed is the Lord Jesus. And he is the fulfillment of the law. All the laws pertain to him. It also shows God's purpose of raising the righteous from the dead, which is an old covenant promise that is accomplished in Jesus. Because the Jews never asked themselves, what is the criteria for being raised from the dead? Although God said, be ye holy like I am holy, they thought that personal holiness was the criteria. But we know that no one can be accepted in the beloved or accepted by God by their personal holiness. So the only way that someone can be risen from the dead as a righteous person who qualifies for the kingdom of God is through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's review these things and understand why this section, Acts 24, 14 to 16, is so important. It establishes that faith in Jesus is an extension of the old covenant. It establishes that Jesus is, in fact, himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is the fulfillment of the law. And also, it shows God's purpose of raising the righteous from the dead, and that is an old covenant promise that can only be accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul continues with his defense. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with the mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before to you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing amongst them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. So here's the thing. There was no problem with what Paul said in Jerusalem, even though he preached about Jesus, but when he got to the point of the resurrection of the dead, that's when the riot started because the Sadducees were there and they did not believe in the resurrection. And so there was a big quarrel between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so both of them turned on Paul, accusing him of starting a riot. But Paul establishes that he was not there for any wrongdoing. In fact, he was there to support his nation of Israel. And how did he do it? He do it, did it by correcting the lies and accusations made by his enemies. So what did he say? He said that he brought money for the relief of the needy of his nation. Where did he do that? He did it right here. I came to bring offerings and alms to my nation. Then he talks about him being purified in the temple. So what did he mean by that? Well, he meant by that, that he brought no one to defile the temple. He had no intention of defiling the temple. In fact, he followed all the restrictions and all the requirements of entering the temple and he did not break any Jewish or Roman law, none whatsoever. And he admits to angering the Sadducees by proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. That he admits in verse 20. But he establishes that that should be no reason for him to be beaten to a pulp by the crowd. So Paul defends himself and corrects the lies and accusations made by his enemies. And so should we. We should not stand for any lies perpetrated against us. We don't mind being persecuted for our faith. 
but we're not going to be persecuted for things that are falsehoods. We need to stand up for ourselves and establish truth. We are people of the truth, and we're going to establish truth every chance we get. Now we continue in the passage. When Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, that's the man who had Paul protected, the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. And so he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for him or visit him. So his defense compelled Felix to show him some leniency and open the door for Paul to preach the gospel to Felix, because now Felix was very curious about this gospel because he found no fault in Paul, just like Pilate found no fault in Jesus. And he might have if Paul had not defended himself. Again, we come down to the same point that this particular chapter, Acts 24, teaches us to defend ourselves against all lies and against all false evidence and anything that's thrown against us other than being persecuted directly for our faith. We are called and we are expected to defend ourselves adequately. So Paul's defense compels Felix to listen to the gospel. Verse 24, after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, isn't that interesting? He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If Paul had not defended himself, I'm not sure that Felix would have been interested in hearing him. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, isn't that interesting? Paul preaches righteousness. He preaches self-control and he preaches judgment. Righteousness, in that it is through the blood of Jesus and through our faith in him that we are made holy and acceptable to the Lord, and we attain the righteousness of Christ, which is implanted in us by the Holy Spirit. Self-control refer refers to holiness. After we're saved, we live and we turn away from sin, we continue to turn away from sin, and we do all we can to put the sin nature to death because now we have the Holy Spirit living in us and we have the power to be able to put to death our sin nature, which is contrary to the Lord. And the judgment to come, well, we have nothing to fear about the judgment because we have been declared innocent by the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in him. We're not going to be judged only in regard to the works that we did for Jesus, receiving rewards or not receiving rewards, but we're not going to be judged or condemned to eternal separation from God in hell. So Paul gave him all this information of the gospel, righteousness, self-control, and judgment. What did Felix do? Felix was afraid. <laughs> yeah, that's a typical response, especially when you talk to people about this. Now, tomorrow I'm seeing a, I told you, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I did the funeral of a, of a gentleman who committed suicide. Tomorrow I'm going to meet with his brother. And his brother, who was not saved, read 2 Thessalonians 1 to 11, which talks about the Antichrist, and he's very disturbed by it. So if you'll remember, please pray for me as I talk to him, and maybe I'll have an opportunity to bring him and to lead him to the Lord. So Felix was afraid, just like my friend Amar was afraid, and he said, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul and that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. Now, Paul defended himself and found favor with Felix. So my question is, what can we do to gain the favor of unbelievers and attain an opening to share Jesus? So what can we do to gain favor from unbelievers and be able to share our faith with them? Mads, what can we do to gain favor with unbelievers? Mads. Well, uh, Um, I would say we can just give me one thing. Now, now I don't know if you talk specifically about the situation where we're under attack. Or... No, no, I'm talking about in general. Okay. Well, we can be nice to them. You know, we'll be like... nice to them. Okay. All right. So, Valerie, how can what can we do with unbelievers to gain favor with them so they can look at us with a good light? What can we do? Be kind. Be, be kind. understanding. Be kind and understanding. Okay, Jeffrey, what can we do to be to gain favor with unbelievers, Jeffrey. Can I say the same? To be kind and to be friendly towards them as much as possible. To be friendly, okay. Uh, Joseph, what can we do to be to gain favor with unbelievers? I'm going to ask almost everybody. 
Joseph, what do you think? What can we do to gain favor with unbelievers? I guess if we're um, if we're uh, preaching uh, to them, yeah. sort of uh, preaching to them, we have no other choice but to tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. Okay, that's a good one. What about you, Tom? What can we do to gain favor with unbelievers? Uh, I think we could be available, especially when they're having the hard times. Oh, I like that. Being available when they have hard times. Very good. Justin, what about you? What can we do to gain favor with unbelievers? Uh, sharing our personal testimonies. Sharing our personal testimony. That's a good one. Okay, thank you. Oliver, what about you? What would you say to gain favor with unbelievers? Offer to pray for them about any situational issue they might have in their life, about health, about their relationships, about their finances, about any, about their medical issues or any other issue. Okay, offer prayer. I like that too. Gerhard, what about you? What, what can we do to gain favor with unbelievers? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I would say point them in the direction of hope. Point them in the direction of hope. I kind of like that too. Well, you guys have given some great answers and Michael won't be able to answer because he's on his phone and I'm not sure if Sister Bev can answer. So we'll just move on in our Bible study and uh, we'll talk right. about that. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Ah, but Sister Bev, what can we do to gain favor with unbelievers? Oh, I would make sure that my approach to the person is your approach really, for what yeah. our approach. Very good. Thank you. Here's some things that I put down. <laughs> Refuse to cheat or cut corners, lie or exaggerate. Perform unusual acts of kindness that let that people rarely display. Like what? Holding the door, letting people cut in line ahead of you. Just simple things. Smile and show appreciation to service people. Obey traffic laws and don't swear at people or or flip the bird when they cut you off. Be considerate of neighbors. Do nothing to provoke rejection. Give people a re or give people a reason to vilify us. Don't give them a reason to vilify us. Be a good listener. And I think that constitutes caring about people. Don't bash people over the head with the Bible. Don't condemn them. Don't tell them they're going to hell. Don't tell them repent because you're going to hell if you don't repent. Be wise. Be careful. You can bring that in later, but Display grace when you show your faith, when you share your faith. And all of the things that you guys said too, there was very good answers. Now here's some acts of random kindness that we can do towards people. And uh, they're very interesting because they have nothing to do with the Christian faith. But I found this on the internet and I found that uh, th these are rare things. You don't see these things happen very often, but they'll definitely open the door to the gospel. So let me just go through them very quickly. Smile at someone just because, for no reason. That, that helps a lot. People don't smile out in the world, believe me. Buy the person behind you a coffee. Now that's something. And some people have even paid for people's groceries. Donate toys to charity. Make homemade dog treats and deliver them to a shelter. <laughs> I like that. Bake cookies or anything for your next door neighbor. Donate to a food bank. Send a card in the mail just because. Okay, that's good too. Volunteer. Donate old blankets and towels to an animal shelter. Paint rocks and hide them for others to find. Send a care package to deployed soldiers. Pay for someone's meal at a restaurant. Let someone go in front of you in line. I already put that one down. Mow the lawn, rake the leaves, and shovel snow for your neighbor. Leave a generous tip at the restaurant. Yes, please. And please, just don't leave a track. If you leave a track to a waitress, put a $20 bill in it or a 5 or a 10 Leave something. Don't just leave the track because they'll tear it to pieces. Send somebody flowers. Help someone before they ask. Carry a stranger's grocery bags. Leave a treat in the mailbox for your mail carrier. I like that one. Donate to your favorite charity. Compliment a stranger. Now, that's an interesting one. Even starting up a conversation with a stranger helps too, because people don't talk to each other. I've seen people stand in bus shelters. They don't even look at each other. Never mind, start a conversation. Bake treats and deliver them to your local police station. Now, there's one I haven't thought of. I can't bake, but that's a good one to support our police department. Or even go up to a police car and say, hey, thank you for your service. But be careful when you do it because <laughs> they're kind of suspicious. 
uh, pick up the litter at a park. Oh, I like that one. There's all kinds of garbage everywhere. It's incredible how dirty and filthy people are. And they, they, we shouldn't allow them to deface our parks. Place a jar of pennies by a, by a wishing fountain. I don't think I like that one too much. Call a relative just to say hello. Send an email, send a greeting, anything. These are some of the things that we can do as acts of kindness to gain favor with the unbelieving so that we can share the gospel. Because I'm telling you, many of these things are just rare. Some of them I've never seen. And some of them I've practiced. And believe me, they work. They really do. And the last portion of this particular chapter is after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, a new governor came in, and Felix, wanting to do the, the, the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So you know what happened? Felix left Paul to rot in prison, and he was left there for two years until Portius Festus came in, and he got another, another opportunity to defend himself and preach the gospel before he was sent to Rome. Now, we're called to defend our faith, so we must prepare ourselves. So I selected three passages, one passage of Scripture, but from three versions of the Bible, to inspire us to defend our faith. Here's the first one from the King James Version. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man who asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Here's the same verse in the American Standard Version. <clears throat> Sanctify in your hearts Christ Jesus as Lord, being ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason concerning the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Meekness and fear, gentleness, grace, love, concern, listening, compassion. And finally, from the Amplified Bible, but in your hearts, set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives. Boy, I love the way the Amplified version just takes the Greek, and just explains it and enhances it so that we can read. It's very difficult to read, but it's a great Bible because it really brings out the meaning of the Greek words. So we acknowledge Jesus. We give him first place in our lives, which is what we have to do if we're going to be effective witnesses, and always be ready to give a logical defense. Logical defense is important because these challenges to our faith are considered logical when actually they're not logical at all. A logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Let me read the whole verse now without interruption. In your hearts, set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your life as Lord. In your lives as Lord, always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And may that be true for every one of us. And that brings us to the end of the Bible study. We must be prepared to share our faith with compassion, with grace, with love, the same compassion, grace, and love that the Lord showed to us were to show to others. And I guarantee you we'll have much more success doing that than, uh, than not. So I want to thank you all for listening. And I'm going to ask Caroline to close in prayer. Caroline, would you close in prayer, please? Father, we thank you for this time, Lord God, for every single person and every heart that's been here. Lord, let the word, the seed of the word that is planted bring fruit. Let it prosper. Let it grow and just bloom, oh God, and produce what you said that it would never come back to you void, but that it would give forth fruit. So we thank you, Lord for doing that in our hearts. Father, I pray that this Bible study will answer questions that people have, will, um, as Pastor ha has shared eloquently, Lord, will help them to defend their faith and, and to stand and not to allow uh, false accusations to come. Lord, there's no reason for us to draw back in cowardice, Father, because we have the boldness of the Holy Spirit and his power. You have equipped us, you have given us everything that we need, and you've given us even the whole armor of God. So we thank you for that, Lord. Let us walk in the fullness of Christ, in the fullness of the armor, in the fullness of power. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week, and I'll see you all on Sunday. Bye-bye.